All right, so um, I'm going to do this rather quickly, partially because we're running out of time, partially because I am mentally and emotionally a little bit drained after the uh, Eastern Front lecture. So, but you can't really explain the Holocaust without having some sort of reference to um, to the Eastern Front, because the final solution was decided at the very same time as the German army stopped on the outskirts of Moscow. So there's a real relationship between what's <coughs> happening on the Eastern Front and what the decisions that are made in Germany to move forward with the extermination of the Jewish individuals. Having said this, um, there is of course anti-Semitism. And uh, anti-Semitism is not something that uh, is German, particularly German. You have anti-Semitism in France, you have it in England. With, Je with, with Ford, what's his first name? It's John Ford, right? No, Gerald. Gerald Ford. Yeah. Gerald Ford. Is it Gerald Ford? No, Gerald Ford is the president. Henry. president. Henry. Who are you talking about? Henry Ford. Henry Ford. Henry Ford. Oh. Thank you. Henry Ford, you have, I, I mean, my point being here that um, anti Semitism, you find it pretty much everywhere. Um, but it really becomes a different kind of anti Semitism when it goes to Germany. And this is uh, an image that I like to show to you because this, my grandfather was a school teacher during this time. And my grandfather taught um, the science of race, as if there is such a thing. You know, the, the Nazis took that science was uh, a reality that existed, and there was the science of race. And this is one of these things that, that just to cover of uh, the school book that if you were to be in Germany in the 1930s, this is what you would have studied. So people would have told you science is a reality. And uh, this is how you see how it happens. I mean, the first, on the most obvious level, this tries to explain, you know, how we always say uh, uh, blonde is Hitler and uh, thin is Göring and tall is, is Goebbels, uh, the sort of saying. This tries to explain why Germans don't always look alike. So they're trying to explain that there's a certain racial variation that you have darker individual, you have the typical Nordic type, of course, over here, tending towards uh, Scandinavia. But that's, that's one thing. But the interesting thing is that all of these individuals are located within the borders of Germany. And then you find the seventh individual right over here. That's the Jew. That is not part of uh, that is not part of uh, Germany. That is already physically removed. I mean, this was before the Holocaust was decided. Um, there was already the notion that you have to take these people out. And I always like to show this image also because it's, it's not a fair depiction. All of these individuals who are depicted over here are probably in their 20s, maybe 30s. Well, this individual is probably in his 50s. From, from age alone, this is not a fair depiction, of course, you have uh, you know, all the stereotypes that you can find about Jewish individuals, the shape of the nose, uh, the thinning hair, uh, that type of thing. Right? So again, much of what race is about, and Dr. Vulcan will give you a much better account of this, is entirely made up. And since we have mentioned racism, I, I should definitely talk a little bit about this, because anti-Semitism is a type of racism, clearly. Um, the most important thing, and I like to summarize it by race is dead. <coughs> if you're a good scientist, if you're a good biologist, you will believe that there is no such thing as race. We have no evidence for this. Uh, we have evidence that we all came out of Africa at one point, 90,000, 100,000 years ago, uh, and that we are very closely related, and uh, that our superficial differences really uh, does not account for genetic difference, okay, whether it's skin color, eye color, uh, color of your hair. Uh, really, th there is no basis of this. Biologists, and there are, there are a few fringes, there's about 1% that still adhere to racial categorizations, unfortunately, but 99% of biologists will tell you race is a construction. It's a cultural construction that we, as human beings, try to impose upon the world to make sense of that the Nazis tried to impose on their world because it's an easily explainable. You have us and you have them. Uh, 
race and racism, unfortunately, race might be dead, but racism is very much alive and it has a very, very long history. It goes back to European history, to be exact, to the 1400s. Um, it basically takes its form in Spain. And uh, in Spain, shortly after the process known as the Reconquista, the reconquest of the Spanish uh, peninsula from uh, the Islamic forces, you had to believe that uh, good Spaniards had to have clean blood. They called it limpieza de sangre. Uh, in other words, the cleansing of the blood. Um, that wasn't really the race of what the Nazis talked about, but somehow that infidel's blood was not as pure as that of Christians. What is racism? Uh, the best definition actually comes from a scholar that works in my field, the Pacific. He has defined racism as the assumption that cultures have natures. You may stand there and say, huh? But that's a fantastic definition. Culture is something that changes, that adapts, that is flexible. When you think that cultures have natures, nature supposedly doesn't change. You're actually imposing something on the culture. You're imposing that people cannot change, that people are not flexible. And uh, James Berlich has this fantastic definition. Racism is the assumption that cultures have natures, and that's fantastic. That you're saying Germans are this, Americans are that, French are this, uh, Mexicans are that. You know, the sort of assumptions that, that are made, and they don't change. They stay the same. That what is American culture has been the same since 1776 to 2016. Or a German culture is the same. I mean, when you're looking at German culture in 1943, I've just argued this, it's a homicidal culture. It's a culture of individuals who are willing to go to every end, to win the war, to kill, no regards of all. Would I accept that as my culture? Yeah. But in 1943, that was very much a fact. Um, when you are a racist, when you believe, when you have racist views, you will believe that genetics determine behavior, that birth is more important of how you were raised, that nature is more important than nature, nature. And generally racism, when it raises this ugly head, and again, we've seen that in the campaign, and I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, but you have two beliefs of racism. There's soft racism, and this hard racism. The soft racism, you basically say, well, Germans are homicidal, but they're able to change. You know, if they're just put in the right environment, if they're put into the right uh, um, context, they'll change. However, if you have hard racism, and that's of course when we get in the neighborhood of Nazi Germany, when you speak about hard genetic racism, then you believe that an individual who has certain defects will never change, cannot change, because it's programmed in their DNA. And you see soft and hard racism is of course categories that unfortunately will not die out, are still with us. As a matter of fact, uh, I had this, I saw this uh, a colleague of ours, bastards. So it's very troubling, but it's still unfortunately with us. <coughs> Excuse me. Move to anti Semitism, which is a form of racism, of course. The difference, I mean, racism is the overarching concept, anti Semitism is a subcategory of racism. Um, Anti-Semitism went through many different changes before you actually arrive in um, Nazi Germany. The first type of anti-Semitism is religious. And uh, this is the notion that supposedly Jewish individuals are at least partially responsible for killing Jesus. They had a choice, they were given a choice 
to uh, set Jesus free. They did not. Thereby, they're complicit in the killing of Jesus. And uh, to give you but one example, the Catholic Church uh, did not change its tune on this until the 1960s. It is still part and parcel, although it has been lowered, of uh, the Orthodox Church. That's why you have a lot of persecutions happening in the 19th century, religious persecutions happening in Russia against Jewish individuals. And the notion is that God's punishment for the Jews, that God came down and punished the Jews by sending them abroad the earth, by basically dispersing them, a process that we know generally as the diaspora, or diaspora. It's Greek for to mean to sow over. It's basically an agricultural metaphor, to basically disperse people in all directions of the winds. And uh, if you ask yourself, well, who still believes this? Uh, it's interesting, there are newspapers in the 19th century, uh, Mormon newspapers, that talk about a particular individual that has always been invoked in Christian mythology. The Wandering Jew. A newspaper printed in the 1870s talks about an individual arriving in what is today Utah. And uh, this individual had a long beard, pantaloons, and basically as the Mormon individuals were asking this individual to stay and to have bread and to have wine and to have water, the individual said, nay, I cannot stay for the crucified has commanded me to move on. This is the image of what's known as the wandering Jew. The sort of notion that Jewish individuals cannot settle down and that this, this inability of settle down is God's punishment for them killing Jesus. So religious anti-Semitism was, uh, and as I mentioned it, it was alive and well in many ways in, into the 20th century. But uh, the suggestion of course was that Jewish individuals could convert and that was the first thing that the Spanish forced Jewish individuals to convert right after they threw the Moors out in 1492. Jewish individuals had the choice. You can convert or you leave. Many of them left. They went to uh, what is the Ottoman Empire, Turkey today. Um, but some of them stayed behind and converted. But then, of course, the Spanish didn't believe them because they converted. But did they really convert? So they introduced the Spanish Inquisition to look into that manner. We know about the Spanish Inquisition, of course. As we move into the 19th century, we have a new sentiment emerging, really from the 18th century on its nationalism. And nationalism really uh, brought up the, the big notion as what is a German, what is a French, what is an American? And does somebody who is Jewish really find their way inside of this category called Germans, Americans, French, British, Chinese. Is it possible? So um, there were notions in the 19th century that Jewish individuals, since they lacked a homeland, could not develop true genius. Stupid notion if you ask me, because after all you have Einstein, you have all kinds of other uh, very highly intelligent individuals, but this was very popular in Europe. To give you but one example of somebody who thought like this, actually two examples. One was Friedrich Nietzsche, and the other one was Richard Wagner, who wrote all these horrible operas. And he truly believed that you, know, he, you, know, you have to be truly German, you have to have roots of being German to develop the genius, to really bring out the genius. So if Jewish individ individuals would be just willing to assimilate within a nation, then it could solve that problem. It's known as the cultural assimilationist, anti-Semitism. Again, it's anti-Semitism, but in many ways we move, we're still in the realm of soft racism, because the notion is there are solutions, and if you're willing to integrate in the German community, French community, American community, then the problem will be solved. Then, of course, as we move deeper into the 19th century, we move into the second half of the 19th century, then we move from soft racism to hard racism. That all emerges, of course, with uh, genetics becoming more popular, 
with a partially misunderstanding, misinterpretation of Charles Darwin's writing, uh, The Origin of the Species. The, the sort of notion that Jewish individuals, even if they try to assimilate, even if they try to convert, there's something that is not about culture, but it's about deeper than that. It's about in your genetic program. So by the 19th century, you get into the racial races. And uh, there the notion is that Jewish individual, and you see this obviously a lot in the Nazis, the notion that Jewish individuals are out for world domination. They are out, they, that's why they, they, they embrace these ideologies such as communism, capitalism, all of these evil things, because they want to control the world. And since they have genetics defects, they cannot be changed. The only way you can deal with this is basically by displacing them, removing them, and separating them. So here you have the beginning, of course, what you will see in Nazi Germany of the ghetto. Parts of the city that are walled off and where you stick Jewish individuals. So building walls is always a very scary thing. Fourth one. And that's when you're fully in Nazi Germany. Eliminationist. That's what Goldhagen says. Daniel Goldhagen, uh, Hitler's willing executioner, says that the Germans, the racial anti-Semitism is one that is widespread. You see it, for instance, in a very uh, important case that happens in the 1890s in France, uh, where a Jewish officer, a French officer, is accused of stealing secrets and passing them to the Germans. But he is accused solely because he's a Jew. Uh, evidence surfaces that he has not passed on, and he, has been, he has been made a scapegoat, and it's clearly a big example, 1890s, of racial anti-Semitism. When Hitler comes to power, he buys into the racial anti-Semitism. But according to Daniel Goldhagen, and that's why we get into the region of the Holocaust, the German anti-Semitism is still a step up from the racial anti-Semitism. It's eliminationist. In other words, you don't just want to displace these individuals. You don't want to wall them off, but you want to get rid of them. You want to kill them, exterminate them. Because they're vermin, they supposedly undermine your community, the national community. And of course, you see parts of that already here. I would argue that this particular pamphlet talks about racial anti-Semitism because you have the removal of the Jewish individual from what is the national or what is imagined as the national community of the Germans. Um, when we talk about the Holocaust, uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, this is basically talking about how the Holocaust should be best uh, best best described. It's difficult to, you know, such a horrifying event. And there are some individuals who have talked about that history might not be good. But I'm telling you might not be good because we, I'm talking about numbers, and, but I'm not really bringing about the suffering. So movies, poems, novels might be a much better way. Uh, one of the best poems is Paul Ceylon's Death Fuge. Uh, and you can read this on your own, posted this lecture. Um, a, a very touching account, uh, account of somebody who has a family, dogs, kind, kind to family and dogs, yet killed indiscriminately, a guard to uh, an extermination. Definitions, because definitions are important and definitions are still up in the air. Uh, how do we define that, that it's not easily definable? How do we define the Holocaust? Is the Holocaust really an appropriate title? There are many that say no. You need to call it something else, Shoah. The Shoah Foundation at USC is a good example. For looking for a different alternative, how do you capture that? That is so difficult to describe. Well, the first thing is, of course, to look at where Holocaust comes from. It's Greek for a completely burnt sacrificial offering. Uh, later in the Bible, a burnt offering to God. Now. Uh, Jewish and Christian theologians both object to this because how can you call the Holocaust a sacrifice? How can you call it a complete sacrifice? Um, 
you know, Jewish people did not select this. They didn't make a choice. So maybe Holocaust is not a good term. Um, so uh, Shoah is the alternative. The Shoah Foundation at USC that basically records the accounts of many Holocaust survivors. Can I use the term here? The other important thing I should say, the Holocaust has been removed from its original context of the Jewish Holocaust and to others, people object to that as well. Mm -hmm. When it's applied to, let's say, the Armenian Holocaust, other uh, things like this, uh, where do you draw the line between the Holocaust and genocide? Well, so those are major debates. But Shoah um, is Hebrew for calamity, and that's, that has been uh, suggested. And as a historian, I find this term very interesting, Shuban Europa. And Shuban is basically, it's a calamity, and it refers to the second destruction of the Temple of Solomon, an event that occurred in the first century after the birth of Christ and led to the dispersal, the diaspora. But Shuban Europa, to call the event, is something that really brings it home to me because you're not just destroying a temple, a physical building, but you're destroying the people themselves, no residents. And when we talk about the Holocaust, of course, then we also have to remember um, this event didn't just uh, persecute Jews and kill Jews, but uh, Roma uh, were also persecuted. They have an another term that I find very interesting because quite a appropriate, pojaramas, which means devouring. And uh, perhaps also very appropriate because you taking people's labor first, you selecting them, taking people's labor first, and you take the clothing, you take the gold fillings, you burn them to a crisp. You completely devour them. You don't eat them, literally, but you take everything from them before they're actually taken, uh, before they're cremated. Well, in this class, when we talk about the Holocaust, we need to put the Holocaust into context. A couple of things. Historians, of course, live and die by sources, by primary sources. When we write history, we go into archives, we write primary sources. And one of the major problems we have with the Holocaust right away, and that's why Holocaust deniers just jump on this right away. And again, we're not entertaining Holocaust denier, but I'm just saying why, why there's such a thing. Is, um, we have too little and too much information. You may say, what? What does that mean? We have a lot of information from the actual death camps. And that is partially because the Germans kept meticulous records. Um, Holorith, the stuff that Dr. Codera talked about, the numbering system, the numbering, the tattoos on people's arms, that's a record. That's a historical source. Um, but on the other hand, when we move up into the Nazi leadership, and you see this a little bit in the movie Conspiracy that we will be screening on Tuesday, the Nazi leadership is very skillful in not signing any documents. So we don't have a smoking gun where Hitler actually orders the Holocaust, where Hitler says this needs to be done now. So that's why we have too much and too little. We have too much on the, on the side of the actual executions we don't have a whole lot when it comes to planning and responsibility and blaming. Then uh, when you really talk about how to interpret the Holocaust, we have two major interpretive camps. And here I need to emphasize this. None of these camps deny the Holocaust. They're all taken it as a fact. But the interpretation of why the Holocaust happened differs. The first camp is the intentionalists, also referred to as the Hitlerists, and they basically say that uh, you can trace the Holocaust to Hitler's main book, My Struggle, Mein Kampf, because he already talks about gassing Jewish individuals. The best example is there's a passage in Mein Kampf where he basically said, if we would have gassed 70,000 Jewish individuals, then not so many people would have died in the trenches of the First World. So intentionally say, ha, it's baby steps. You start with Mein Kampf, the Nazis take power, and you have Kristallnacht, or Kristallnight, 
the Knight of Broken Glass, then you have the Holocaust. Baby steps. So that's the first camp. It basically traces everything to Hitler. The other camp are the structuralists. And the structuralists say that the Holocaust wasn't as neatly planned as we might assume. It wasn't a baby steps that went from Mein Kampf all the way to the actual execution of the, of the Holocaust. But really, you have unsystematic and improvised policies that are happening along the way. Uh, Jewish individuals are targeted and ultimately eliminated because as a result of a series of ad hoc responses to the competition and division among the Nazi state and its institutions. Okay, for instance, the SS, uh, policies of occupation. And you see this a little bit in movie conspiracy. To give you one example, you have uh, the SS officials coming from Poland. They're basically saying, we got a problem. You send all your Jewish people, populations here. We put them in these ghettos. We have a health problem. And they're overcrowding. Uh, once you have typhus, you have cholera, this will become a problem. Again, but what you have to uh, understand, what they perceive as a problem, is a problem that they themselves caused. I mean, Germany didn't have to invade Poland. Germany didn't have to discriminate against Jewish individuals. So the final solution, the, the structuralists say, was the result of a massive self-induced administrative problem, should be, not problems, of the Nazi regime. So the Nazi regime brought this up upon themselves. What is the main difference between intentionalists and structuralists? If you're an intentionalist, then you follow the argument, hey, I was just following orders. You know, Hitler perceived this, he wrote in Mein Kampf, I was pulling the trigger uh, as an Einsatzgruppen policeman because I didn't have a choice. The structuralists would say, no, you did have a choice. Because there's all these steps along the way, and there's all these different things happening. You have to take responsibility of what you do. That's why mm, Dr. Volken and I are probably leaning more towards the structuralist than the intentionalist. But you will see that uh, some of our interpretations sometimes fall in the middle. Of it. Because intentionalist and structuralist, nobody's exactly an intentionalist and nobody's exactly a structuralist. There's a little bit of both. So let me explain this again, intentionalist. You have uh, the major book, Mein Kampf, and you have the baby steps. It starts with the boycott of Jewish businesses right after the Nazis take power. Then in 1934, 1935, you have a set of laws that basically strip Jewish individuals of their civic rights. Uh, they're kicked out of the universities, out of schools, um, and if they still remain in Germany, they have to carry the letter J, Jude, uh, Jewish individuals, in their passport, and they have to adopt middle names. In other words, uh, your middle name as a woman, Jewish woman, will be Sarah, Sarah, and your middle name as a man will be Israel, to mark you mark you as a Jewish individual. Signs like this went up all over Germany. Jewish people are not uh, allowed in this village. See this guy looking at this. The interesting thing is that many of these villages, probably many villages couldn't tell you what a Jewish individual would look like. I mean, these are just uh, ad hoc weird things that people put up because they wanted to somehow uh, get the favor of the Nazi Nazi regime. And here's where the structuralist and the intentionalist start to diverge. Kristallnacht, also known as the Night of Broken Glass, 1938. A single event happens. Uh, there's an attempt on the life of a uh, German ambassador in Paris. And that's per, uh, an attempt perpetrated by a Jewish individual. Consequently, the uh, Nazi leadership says, let's crack down on the Jewish individuals within Germany. Synagogues, that's why it's called Crystal Night, go up in flames because of the crystal that falls on the streets. Jewish individuals are beaten, uh, some are killed, many of them arrested. Now as that, you know, again, structuralist and intentionalist would differ on this account because the structuralist would say, this is very similar 
to what happens in 19th century Russia. This is pogrom. This is state-induced violence against a minority, against a religious minority. Intentionalists would say, just another baby step that ultimately leads to this. I talked about these individuals already before. What makes the Eastern Front different from the Western Front is that you have these special groups, Einsatzgruppen, special groups of individuals who march in the rear of the German army, select Jewish individuals, select Jewish individuals and just shoot them. Dr. Volkan will talk about the Holocaust by bullets. This is the first step. This is the first elimination. And it was perpetrated by ordinary men. Why did they do it? And here's where structuralists say, why do you have Einsatzgruppen now? Why not in France? Why not in Holland? Why not in Belgium? And uh, the structuralists would say, because the Jewish population under German control is increasing, not gradually, but it's basically increasing leaps over bounds. And the, the Nazis foresee that they have a problem. They want to reduce the problem. They estimated there's about five million Jewish individuals that will come under control if they take over the Soviet Union. So we cut that population down. Intentionists would say baby steps. Structuralists were saying, no, we have to look at the war itself, the development of the war. This is a great book. Uh, Dr. Volkan again will talk much about that, so I don't have to. Christopher Browning's Ordinary Man. It's, it talks about a reserve police battalion that basically executed this and why people would do this. Because the majority of these individuals were an older men, generally 35 to 45. Uh, some of not, not greatly educated, but uh, they, had, they were married, they had children, and yet they were killing. And why is that? And Dr. Volkan will have a lot to say. Structuralists would uh, point this out too. Baby steps, not just baby steps. Hmm. There's a particular chilling source. And when I talk about historical sources, it's known as the coffin map. It is done by one of the individuals who led Einsatzgruppe A. It was uh, the Einsatzgruppe that was mostly active in Belarus and the Baltic Republics. And you notice that there are coffins. And the coffins and numbers next to them, of course, refer to the number, excuse me, number of Jewish individuals killed in these regions. 41,000, 138,000, 35,000, about a thousand. And then he reads here with an exclamation mark, Juden frei, free of Jews. The individual who drafted this map was uh, Franz Walter Stalecker. He was proud of what he did. He wasn't just following orders. He wasn't just doing this because Hitler. He was proud. If, if, you, if you don't see some certain pride in this, that you're actually producing a document like this, extolling what you're doing, extolling genocide, extolling that you're killing thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. Fortunately, this guy, I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately, I, it just baffles me. He gets killed towards the end of the war. It would be nice to have this guy brought to trial and talk about his intention of why he produced this one. Structuralists would say, this makes sense. He's a careerist. He wants to advance, in the, and he saw that by killing more and more Jewish individuals, that would be his path towards uh, a very successful career in the SS. You will watch the movie Conspiracy on Tuesday. This movie is entirely about uh, the last chapter of the Holocaust. The Einsatzgruppen is the Holocaust by bullets. They, they killed an estimated 1.5 million. 1.5 to 2, still debated. 1.5 to 2 million uh, individuals, mostly in, in the Soviet Union, but also <clears throat> in Poland. When we go to the final solution, and uh, it's interesting, the final solution is that the Nazis, the Nazi term for the Holocaust, they called it final solution because they have tried other solutions. Forced immigration. Before 1938, before 1939, many Jewish indiv individuals were encouraged to leave Germany, or to leave the areas under German control. And 
but they didn't necessarily want to because the Germans would confiscate all their property. They would ask outrageous fees uh, for, for uh, these, these people to leave the country. And then when World War II started, the Germans occupied France. They had this quote unquote, I'm saying quote unquote here, brilliant solution of taking the entire Jewish population under the control to the island of Madagascar. I don't know if you know about Madagascar. It's an island off the coast of East Africa. It's also one of these nice movies, right? Madagascar with dancing animals. <laughs> this is not a funny thing. This actually was a serious proposal that was circulated among Nazi leadership to take the entire Jewish population under their control to Madagascar. To cut a long story short, this, this failed because uh, the British Navy, of course, controlled over the seas. It would have amounted to uh, just a gigantic transport. So by the time we move into Operation Barbarossa in June of 1941, the Germans are already considering other options. They're doing it tacitly, without much knowledge, behind the front line, but then they realize something has gone deadly wrong. In December of 1941, the German offensive is stopped. What is the first action that the Germans take? Of course, they, they try to strengthen the Eastern Front. That's the very first action. The second action is they have a meeting in January of 1942 to decide the final solution, which basically means they have, they're already at the process of constructing death camps in Nazi-occupied Poland, mostly, far away from the German boundaries. We have already seen what happens if you have all of these operations happen within Germany, especially during the T4 program, the euthanasia program. So far away, we're in Poland, where nobody will discuss. And uh, it was led by this individual, Reinhard Heydrich. And you will see him in the movie, Conspiracy. Uh, all right, one more thing. And um, this, this actually comes from Dr. Volkin can say more about this. We know, know more uh, about the actual execution of the Holocaust because there's a lot more ghettos and a lot more concentration camps that we have formerly assumed. This shows um, how many there were in the Ukraine, in Belarus, Poland, and Lithuania alone. And uh, the kind of orchestration that this needed to basically combine anything. The location of the death camps, you probably have heard about them. The most famous one is Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, that one actually stayed operational until almost the very end of the war, until late January of 1945, when uh, the Soviet troops would liberate this camp. Many of the other ones, and this is something that I just learned recently, Majdanek, Sobibor, Treblinka, were camps that were already destroyed in 1943. When you go into the sites, for instance, of Treblinka, you will just find a meadow. Because the Germans knew that they were doing the wrong thing here. They were already trying to uh, bury the evidence. So, that's all. <laughs>